Good evening, all. Tonight, we are talking about the philosophy of David Hume. So starting off with our summative quotation, he tells us, reason is not only to be a slave of the passions. So what are we to take from this? Oh, and this is my cat Adolf. Uh, the treatise on the human nature is one of the most important philosophical books ever written in the English language. And he's going to be skeptical of both scientific knowledge as well as our morality, uh, saying that neither of them really have any kind of rational basis. And instead, uh, they've got their origins and features of human psychology. So if you are taking psychology concurrently with this, or if you've taken it recently, uh, you're probably going to see a whole lot of this uh, as, as kind of familiar here. And so he's really giving us sort of an experimental approach to this. Now, he wrote this when he was 26 years old, and while it's become one of the most philosophically important books, uh, the British people did not agree. Uh, Hume himself described it as having fallen dead born from the press. And so he tried reworking it a couple of times, and it, and it just wasn't popular. Um, but uh, he thought it was his best work ever. So there you go. Now, Hume is going to start out by dividing all of our sense, that is, all of our empirical perceptions into ideas and impressions, and says simple ideas cause, uh, or I'm sorry, simple impressions cause simple ideas, and from simple ideas form complex ideas. Uh, sometimes these are complex impressions, which are memories, so something really striking happens to us, and we recall it for a very long time. Uh, sometimes instead we arrange it in a new form. This is imagination. We're taking stuff that we've seen or we're experienced, we've experienced, and we're uh, kind of kind of imagining what could happen with it. And so Hume is going to take this and run with it. Now, uh, a couple of things that we need to know about Hume is he is um, was not necessarily an atheist, but was certainly very hostile to religion uh, in an age that really didn't welcome that, and yet seems to have supported the idea of polytheism or really likes the idea that perhaps the world was created by you know, a relatively young God and this was his first effort and not a particularly good one. Uh, so he had some strange ideas there. But his main notion uh, is going to be one of sympathy, saying that reason can't motivate us to act. So uh, moral judgments have motivating powers. If I see a cat in need, uh, I might go down to the uh, uh, to the city pound and, and see if I can volunteer or something. Uh, if I see someone that is, is struggling with homelessness, I might be motivated to go and volunteer with Habitat for Humanity and build a house. Now, here's the thing. I'm not the most efficient person to work with animals, nor am I certainly the most skilled in terms of house building. And so it really doesn't make a lot of sense for me to be there rationally because I'm not the most efficient it would make a lot more sense for me to say, here's how much I make in an hour, it's not a lot, and then write them a check for that, that they can then leverage and get a lot more done than I would be able to go and volunteer and do. But we don't like to do that. Well, I mean, some of us like to do that, but we like to do the work ourselves. So he says moral judgments have to be based on desire, which comes from our passion, and also from our feelings, which comes from emotion. And that feeling we call sympathy. And literally, etymologically, sim, same, pathos, striving, yearning, desperation, or path that we're traveling along with these folks. And he says, really, this moral right and wrong, this virtue and vice, are just the tendencies certain kinds of actions have and traits of characters that evoke sentiments in us in approval or disapproval. Where feelings of sympathy might vary from one person to another, you know, some people simply aren't that all, aren't all that sympathetic, other people are extremely sympathetic with other people. So where do we go? He says, well, judgments probably won't vary within a given society. We have a social need for shared judgments about virtue and vice. So to kind of borrow over from psychology, think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, Abraham Maslow has a, this triangular pyramid looking thing uh, that is a hierarchy of needs. And it starts at the bottom, our most uh, direct needs, our basic needs, then safety needs, then social needs, then esteem needs, then self-actualization. So basic needs, that's uh, you know food, shelter, and so on. Safety needs, that's where Hobbes puts our ethics. Because remember, for Hobbes, you band together to prevent your destruction from other people. 
Hume puts it just above that in social needs. You know, uh, I have a social need not to be that one weird outlier doing strange things that are not acceptable in this society. Esteem needs, now I want to be liked. And when we get to that highest level, that self-actualization, that's kind of where Aristotle, Plato, Augustine, Aquinas, and all of those guys fell in because it was more about how do I relate to myself, my own eudaimonia, how do I relate to God, and so forth. But uh, Hume being kind of the social psychologist is going to put it in a social need. I'm inclined to think he's right. Our moral judgments, he says, are based on the esteem of a judicious spectator. So it's someone that's watching and judging. And if we feel approval or disapproval, well, it's kind of like we're uh, approaching it from their point of view. So a bit about Hume. Uh, he's born in Edinburgh in 1711, dies in 1776, so not an old guy. Wrote the treatise that we read at age 26. Also wrote a multi-volume history of England, which is very, very good. Uh, so if you didn't particularly care for this reading, I certainly don't blame you. It's not his best, in my opinion. Uh, but his history of England is sustained brilliance. He starts with the invasion of Julius Caesar in 63 BC and continues up to uh, William and Mary of Orange in the 1660s. Uh, and it's, it's a really an enjoyable read, especially if you like history. So Hume is a skeptical philosopher. He's an empiricist, so he's interested in sense perceptions and says, um, humans only have knowledge of those things that they experience. And so he's going to divide perceptions between strong and lively impressions. So if I were to lift Adolf here up, Adolf is a black and white cat. Okay, you have a strong and lively impression of that because I've just drawn his att your attention to him. Okay, down you go, Bob. Now, think of fainter and weaker ideas, like what color was the t-shirt of the person who walked by you last? Okay, you probably noticed it, but you really weren't all that intent in recording that information and using it later. <clears throat> or if you think of um, the last time you encountered a stoplight, what color was on top or on the far left if it was one of those horizontal ones. And he's going to tell us that all of the mental behavior that we have is really dictated by custom. That we're just kind of this bundle of sensations associated with self. I'm the person who sees these things, hears these things, smells these things, tastes these things, and so on. Uh, so he's kind of a sentimentalist in that way. Now, what Hume is going to leave behind him is really good stuff. Uh, Kant, who we're reading for next week, says Hume woke him up from his dogmatic slumbers. Dogma is that part of religious teaching, usually couched as doctrine. Uh, it's that subset that can't be challenged or can't be questioned. Um, so dogmatic slumbers, you're just kind of sleepwalking, blindly accepting stuff. He says Hume woke him up from that. Uh, Hume's going to be very influential in utilitarianism, which we're going to be talking about the week following that. So there will be a whole lot of Hume and Kant, but very little Kant and Hume, and you'll kind of see what I mean when we get to him. Uh, as a prose stylist, uh, again, as an author, uh, he's very famous. He, he pioneered the essay as a literary genre, along with Francis Bacon and Michel de Menton, uh, and wrote along with contemporary intellect. I'm sorry, you're probably hearing my chicken outside, uh, like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Adam Smith, Samuel Johnson, James Boswell, a lot of these fairly famous writers. So key concepts for him. The first one is reason, and this is going to depart significantly from what we've heard of reason before. Reason for Hume is merely the discovery of facts, that is to say, uh, the discovery of truth and falsehood about the world. And reason can't tell us to do anything except in relation to some desire, that is to say, passion. Okay? And moral sense. He says moral distinctions like virtue and vice are really based in sentiment and feeling, not in reason. And morality is more properly felt than judged of. Another key concept for him is that sympathy. Uh, this is we share in the psychological capacity to share in the pleasures and pains of other people. Today, sympathy has taken on kind of a negative connotation. Uh, if somebody dies, we, we send their survivor and relatives a sympathy card. Hume doesn't mean it strictly in that sense, though. Uh, he means if something bad happens to someone, we feel sympathetically bad for them. If something good, we feel sympathetically good for them. Okay, so... The accepted notion, says Hume, is that men are virtuous only as long as they conform themselves to its dictates. That every rational creature, remember that was the big Aristotle thing, is obliged to regulate his actions by reason and you conform to virtue. What a new idea is, is that abstract or what we might call demonstrative reasoning 
never influences any of our actions. It just directs our judgment when we're talking about causes and effects. So think about it like this. If you have the prospect of pain or pleasure from any object, you feel a consequent emotion of aversion or propensity. You're carried to avoid or embrace that which will give you unease or satisfaction. Uh, so think of your stove at home. Okay, uh, I'm going to go in and cook a lovely dinner this evening. So it gives me the prospect of pleasure. I have a propensity for it. I'm going to embrace it because it would be satisfying. But if I were to slip and burn myself on the top, that would bring pain to which I have an aversion. I want to avoid that and it makes me uneasy. Okay, That's not a reasonable impulse. It's just kind of directed towards it. And the prospect of pleasure or pain, aversion and propensity arises towards every object we might think. So reason is really just the discovery of the connection between those things and that's what's able to affect my behavior reason alone doesn't produce any action and it doesn't give rise to choice reason also can't pre uh, prevent me from choosing and it's not going to necessarily help me figure out which passion or emotion is appropriate in other words nothing can contradict uh, an impulse of the passions but a contrary impulse okay so what opposes our passion isn't necessarily reason. And there was my rooster, okay? Reason is, Hume said, and ought only to be a slave of the passions and can't have any other office but to serve and obey them. Passions are original existences. Uh, so right now, I would really like a bacon double cheeseburger. That's an original existence in me. It just sounds really good right now. So does Thai food, by the way. Thank you, Stockholm. It's impossible, therefore, that that passion can be opposed to reason. It's not unreasonable that I want a bacon double cheeseburger. The only thing that could be opposed to that would be if there were some judgment or opinion, says Hume. So he says, these are the only times that you can have affections that are unreasonable. So you've got a passion, such as hope or fear, grief or joy, despair or security, founded on the supposition of the existence of objects which really don't exist, that would be unreasonable. Uh, so if you were concerned that your significant other was seeing someone else on the side, and it turns out they're not, they're just really busy, or maybe they're even planning a secret trip for you both, that would be unreasonable. How about this? In exerting any passion and action, we choose means insufficient for the designed end, deceive ourselves in our judgment of causes and effects, that's unreasonable. So he's really excited out there. We know that I want my bacon double cheeseburger, but instead of going down the street to the shop that sells them, I'm just gonna sit here and meditate my cheeseburger until it mystically appears in front of me. Well, I'm gonna be waiting a long time because I've chosen means insufficient for my designed end. It just doesn't work that way. So where a passion is neither founded on false suppositions, you know they're cheating, nor chooses means insufficient for their end, meditating the cheeseburger, understanding can't justify or condemn it. And so he gives us this list of things that he says, it's not contrary of reason to prefer the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of my finger. If I've got an itch and everybody else has to go for me to scratch it, well, then that's just too bad. And he says, I can even want those things that are bad for me. I know some things that I probably don't need to be eating that bacon double cheeseburger. Uh, I probably don't need to have, you know, a small dram of whiskey after supper, but I may. It might be bad for me, but I can prefer that, says Hume. I shouldn't be able to. In fact, a small good, something just like having my cat snuggle up on my arm here, this could produce a desire superior to what comes from the greatest and most valuable enjoyment. I might enjoy this more than, say, going to the theater to see something that I've really been waiting for. Passions have to be accompanied by some false judgment for them to be unreasonable. So it's not the passion that's unreasonable, it's the judgment itself. So reason and passion can't oppose each other is what he says. Reason exerts itself without producing any sensible emotion. If we work through a problem, for instance, um, you know, we may be math phobic, we may be scared to death of math, we gotta work through this math problem. It's not the thinking itself that bothers us so much as our apprehension about our ability to do that. And he acknowledges that we're able to act against our own such interests. We can do bad things if we choose to. Uh, we can choose to smoke, we can choose to drink, we can choose not to wear a seatbelt, we can choose all kinds of different things. And 
we're not necessarily thinking of the greatest possible good. Now, this is something, if you're in the habit of making parenthetical notes, that Bentham and Mill were, are going to disagree with Hume on. Okay. Hume tells us the only things that are ever present to my mind are my sense perceptions. And they're going to be those strong and lively impressions or the fainter and weaker ideas. Okay. Now, he tells us that philosophy is essentially divided into two categories, speculative and practical. Speculative stuff would be like, what is the meaning of life? Which we all know is 42. Or is there a God? If so, why? If not, why not? Why do bad things happen to good people? And so on and so forth. Okay. Morality, he tells us, though, is always going to be under that practical side. Why? Well, because we're actually doing things with our morality. We apply it to real life situations uh, so that our behavior is regulated and so that the world is a better place. As long as we admit, he says, that reason doesn't really influence our passions and our actions, we shouldn't pretend it's doing any more than that. All reason is, is the discovery of truth or falsehood. So for instance, if I were to ask you if you've ever been in love, and you say, well, yes, I've, I've fallen in love before, and I'd say, no, you haven't. I really can't say that. I'm not in a position to say that. One, because I'm not you, but two, it's really not the kind of thing that can be a true false statement. Truth or falsehood is agreement or disagreement either to the real relation of ideas or the real existence in matter of fact. If I could say the blue whale isn't the, um, the largest animal on earth, I could say it's actually the pygmy mouse. Well, no, it's not because that's just a false statement. Okay? Whatever's not susceptible to agreement or disagreement and is incapable of being true or false, for example, have you been in love before, can never be an object of our reason. So we've got these passions, these volitions. Remember, volition is the same root word as volunteer, just means choice. And actions, they're not susceptible to agreement or disagreement. They're just original facts and realities in themselves. So they can't be for or against reason. Actions are not meritorious because they conform to reason. In fact, most of the things that we consider are meritous um, running into a burning building to save a child. Okay? That's not a reasonable thing to do. That goes against all of the things that tell us, hey, preserve your own life as best you can. It's a passionate thing to do. It's an emotional thing to do, but certainly not a reasonable thing to do. And yet still, we laud that. We praise that. We say it's a good thing. Reason can't be the source of our moral good and evil, says, says you. Reason's kind of inactive. Uh, can't be the source of so active a principle as the conscience. So if you've got a guilty conscience, if you lay awake at night thinking about that thing that you shouldn't have said eight years ago, whatever it may be, you know, reason can't be behind that. It's an unreasonable thing to do. You can't go back and correct the, the, the ills of past years. It's an emotional thing to do. It's a passionate thing to do, but not a reasonable one. So he gives us an if-then statement. For a guy who doesn't like reason, he uses a lot of reason to tell us that we shouldn't. If the thought and understanding were alone capable of fixing the boundaries of right or wrong, then the character of virtuous and vicious either has to lie in some relation of objects or matter of fact, which is discoverable by our reason, says here. Virtue and vice then would have to consist in some relations. If the relations are susceptible to certainty and demonstration, that is, if we can hold them up and show them to you, then you gotta confine yourself to one. Either they resemble each other, they're somehow contrary in degrees or quality, their proportions and quantity and number are different. And he says morality isn't any of these things and it's not gonna help us find them out either. Reason, science, is nothing but the comparing of ideas and the discovery of how they relate to one another. So for instance, he tells us that man, because we're endowed with reason, <clears throat> we're set to a higher standard of things. But he tells us also every animal that has sense and appetite will be susceptible to the same virtues and vices. Adolf here has sense and has appetite, mostly for cat food and naps since he's about 14 years old. Okay. Now, he can have that. Outside, I've got a greedy cat, though, who will eat all the food, even if he's going to vomit it up later. He just wants to eat all the food before everyone else does. I've also got a very generous dog who thinks she's everything's mama. She's not that bright, but she thinks she's responsible for every bird, squirrel, and anything else that happens to be in the yard. 
these seem to be virtuous or vicious behaviors in things that Aristotle would say ought not to have them, which tells us that these are not based in reason, but are our emotions and passions. And so Hume gives us a process. He says, take any action allowed to be vicious. Let's say killing someone, okay? We're gonna examine it in all lights. Maybe we're at war and you're an enemy soldier and I kill you. Maybe you're a convicted criminal and I'm the state-sponsored executioner and I kill you because it's my job. Maybe I'm just not paying attention. I'm backing out of my driveway. You chose to take a nap there. I roll over you and I kill you accidentally. Maybe I'm backing out of my driveway and I knew you were there and I back over you, okay? These are all different lights. And he says, whichever way you take it, you only find passions, motive, volitions, and thoughts. The fact of the matter is, in any of these instances, it's the same net effect. Someone was killed. But how was I feeling? What was I motivated by? What did I choose to do? What was I thinking? And that's about the only matter of facts in the case. He says there's no vice there. <clears throat> this is what makes Hume an amoralist, or we might say a moral nihilist. If you're in the habit of making little notes off to the side, you might note that we're going to see this again when we get to Friedrich Nietzsche in a much more extreme example. So basically what he's saying here is that actions themselves are neither moral or immoral. They're kind of morally inert. They're neither good nor bad. And this applies if we're talking about killing someone, this applies if we're talking about stealing from someone, this applies if we're talking about lying to someone. Now, obviously, it's not extended uh, to things like crimes of sexual predation, which are just evil no matter what. But in this context, he says, you know, a lot of the things that we talk about as being evil really aren't good or bad. They just kind of are. And it's what the people are thinking about them in the background. So he says, the distinction of virtue and vice, not founded on relation of objects, not perceived by our reason, and so he's going to give us a logical premise or a series of them that leads to a logical conclusion. So we'll call these P1, P2, P3, and then C. P1, since virtue and vice are not discoverable by mere reason, and P2 are decisions concerning moral rectitude and depravity, rightness and wrongness, respectively, are evidently perceptions, we perceive them as being that, and P3, since all perceptions are either strong and lively impressions or fainter and weaker ideas, and if it's not one, it's the other. Therefore, morality must be properly felt than judged of. If I've got a sense of virtue, I feel a certain kind of satisfaction when I contemplate a character of that kind. Uh, so if I see someone helping an old lady across the street or doing something nice for someone, it satisfies me to see that. It makes me happy. I think they're a good person, and I think I ought to be more like that. That feeling constitutes praise or admiration. But I don't infer a character to be virtuous just because it pleases me. We just feel that it's virtuous. Virtue produces love or pride. I love it when I see other people doing good things. I feel proud when I do good things. Vice produces humility or hatred. <clears throat> I hate it when I see people doing bad things. I'm humiliated when I acknowledge that I've done bad things. In every case, I judge one by the other. Actions themselves because they're not coming from any constant principle of my reason, really don't have any influence on love, hatred, pride, humility, and we don't consider them in morality. Remember, this makes them a moral nihilist or an amoralist. Actions themselves, neither good nor bad, just the motives, the passions, the thoughts, and the choices. So I never consider any single action when I'm inquiring into the origin of morals, he says. Actions are better indications of character than words, wishes, or sentiments. Now, Actions speak louder than words, version Hume. The true origin of morals, he says, is in the force of sympathy. If I see someone else being happy, I'm more likely to be moved to be happy myself. If I see someone else being sad, I'm more likely to be moved to be sad myself. And it's a cause and effect thing with Hume. If I see the effect of their sadness, my mind moves to the cause of it. Maybe they had a death of a loved one. If I see the cause of their happiness, maybe they got a new job, I move to the effect of, I want to be happy along with them. It says we're only sensible of these causes and effects, and we infer the passion, and this gives rise to our sympathy. Sympathy is a source of esteem, feeling good about something. And he says we pay them to all the artificial virtues, and he uses that very specifically. He does mean they're artificial, they're fake, they're not real. 
Sympathy is a very powerful principle in human nature. Sympathy, for instance, has a great influence on our taste of beauty. One of my guilty pleasures is cheesy kung fu movies. I love them. The cheesier, the better. My wife, on the other hand, cannot stand them. But every once in a while, because she kind of likes me, you know, going on 13 years now, she'll sit down and watch part of one. Now, she might be on her phone during it, but she's sitting in there with me, and that's cool. Every once in a while, I will listen to her long, drawn-out plans about what she wants to do in our garden, and I nod as if I'm interested, and I, I, I don't, I'm not worried. I'll do what she needs me to do out there, and that's about it. Sympathy has a strong effect on this. Sympathy produces our morals in all of these artificial virtues that we've kind of made up, okay? And this is where we get the approval of these virtues. This presumption becomes a certainty after we watch for a little while, okay? So some philosophers, he says, have presented all moral distinctions as the effect of artifice and education, and they kind of are. When we learn all of these virtues, justice, temperance, prudence, fortitude, obedience, courage, kindness, we see that those things seem to make life at least a little bit better, but that's not necessarily always consistent with our experience. There's other virtues and vices. And if we didn't have this natural feeling of approbation or approval and blame, it couldn't be excited by people, okay? Uh, these adjectives that we use like laudable, praiseworthy, odious, they wouldn't make sense to us because, I don't know, we just don't feel any personal connection to it. He tells us we've got things like law and justice, not because they're natural, not because they're desirable for their own sake, as Socrates and Plato had tried to suggest, but because we kind of voluntarily came together and established them as conventions. We recognized that we live together better when we've got them, and so we made them up. Now, in order to prevent problems, we kind of fix our gaze on these general points of view. You may recall Aristotle had that posepi topolu, Kind of by and large, for the most part, sort of kind of maybe nine times out of 10, as close as we can hope to get. We're going to look at these feelings of praise and blame and sort of figure out where that pleasure and disgust comes from, what qualities of character, be they virtuous or vicious, give rise to them. And in some of this, you know, we overlook our own interest. We just kind of kind of blame things. We see things that are upsetting or things that make us happy. Pardon me. Um, you know, really, this virtue and vice is Hume, the distinction between moral good and evil, it's not going to be made by reason. Morality isn't susceptible of demonstration, and it really kind of depends on my perceptions, my appetites, and that's highly subjective. How I feel about a given thing, how you feel about a given thing, might be radically different. Now, socially, he maintains that we've got a need for some kind of shared judgments. I mean, we're probably all going to look poorly upon someone that we see kicking a puppy, we're probably all gonna look well upon someone that we see helping the little old lady across the street, but those are pretty broad categories and not ones that we're too likely to encounter all the time. He says if the impression left on us is agreeable, it's probably virtue. If it makes us uneasy, probably vice. If you've ever seen anything so bad that you felt physically ill, it just really upset you, that's a natural feeling of vice. And so in Hume's moral uh, philosophy, there's really no room for these eternal and immutable standards. Because of course things are going to change. They change all the time. Some things are no longer going to be moral or immoral after a while. So these rules of justice, he says, it's not a natural virtue. It's made up by our education, human convention. He calls it artifice. Convention just means con with venire, we come. So we come together and we go, hey, let's make this law about this. We become aware gradually of the advantages of having things like that, law and justice, and that's what stipulates the convention. We go, we gotta have this stuff, okay? So justice, for Hume's sake, very different from Hobbes, very different from Aquinas and so on, definitely different from Plato, doesn't come from the public interest. It's not founded on reason, it's founded on our impressions because we felt good or bad about it and sympathy with public interest is going to be what gives rise to this stuff. Uh, so Hume, is, he's got kind of a, a contentious point of view here. It's not one that we, with which we may readily agree, but it does give us a very psychological background of sort of where he's coming from. So it's something that we want to be aware of. Uh, to contrast this, next week we are reading Immanuel Kant, uh, his Groundwork for the Foundation of the Metaphysics of Morals, and he's going to take almost the exact opposite approach of Hume. 
So take a look, see what you think. As always, put any questions down in the comments or post them in the discussion, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time.